All right, we are continuing with our series on the book of Galatians, which is found in the New Testament, written by the Apostle Paul, who is an apostle, simply means one that's sent out. And that's all it means, by the way. I'm an apostle. Well, it basically means I'm being sent out. And the Apostle Paul, uh, this is about 2,000 some odd years ago, about 45 to 50 years after Jesus arose again from the dead and rose to heaven. Uh, what happened was the Apostle Paul wrote letters to a, an area of which would be modern Turkey today. He didn't write it to a Galatian church. He wrote it to a region, which is modern-day Turkey, and he was writing a letter to them. And I, I'm absolutely positively amazed that the same stuff that they were facing back then is the same stuff we're facing now, a little bit different, but the same problem, the same tension. And so it, it just, it's amazing, and he's pretty passionate about this book. I mean, he even tells off Peter. I had to correct Peter. And so we talked about that. And, and basically, I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, but have you ever been to a church where it just seems like you just can't do enough to make God happy? It's like, I got to do this. I got to do all these little motions. I got to bow. I got to kneel. I got I to gotta give. I got to wear this thing, go to the conference. I have to do all these things. And, and I can't do it all. There's, there's no way that I can do that. I, I, you know, and, this, and maybe you're married and, and you see another family and it's like this the, the, the wife, the, the mother's like amazing. I mean, she's like always dressed impeccably. Her kids follow her around like a little trail of ducks. They all behave well. They dress well. It looks like Family Circle magazine cover. It's, it makes you sick, you know. And, and, and it, they just do so well. And, and how your kid, all oh, my kids in the on the roll. And it's like I'm on a traveling sports day. Everything is just amazing. You go out to eat at a restaurant. Your kids are climbing up the wall and setting the curtains on fire. And meanwhile, the kids behave so well. Mommy, may I please have uh, some more mashed potatoes? I mean, it's just like, ah. And you feel like you're not good enough. Or this person has their marriage all together. They're always so lovey-dovey. And you just can't, you're like, oh, boy, I can't believe I married that. And, you know, meanwhile, people are happy with their marriage. You're like, what's the deal with these people? I can't, I can't do that. And then also you go to a prayer meeting. And you don't want to go to a prayer meeting because people pray. And it's kind of scary. And they, all of a sudden, some guy goes, Lord God Almighty, we beseech thee, Father. And they, and they speak in an, an eloquent, I mean, it's just like Elvis. It's beautiful, right? I don't like Elvis. But anyhow, it's beautiful prayers. And, and you're like, I can't pray like that. And then another thing is, they live, they live so well. I mean, they, they quote scriptures like it's going, I mean, unbelievable, like a walking encyclopedia. And you're like, uh, I don't know. All I, knew, all I know is the book of Job. And, and palms, I don't know. And, and you're struggling, right? And you feel like, I don't want to go to that church. I got to dress and uh, I got to dress all nicely. I got to act nice to everyone. I got to smell good, look good. I, I don't drive that. I don't, I'm not married to that. I don't have that. And it's like, you know, I just can't do this thing. And, and they always seem like they're upset with everybody all the time, you know? Ugh. And so maybe you grew up that way and you get frustrated. I just can't do it. Well, I have good news for you. If that's the kind of church you're looking for, we're not that way, okay? We're, we're a church where we are just ordinary human beings serving an extraordinary God. And the beautiful thing is that everyone has the same value to God, whether you have your act, to, quote unquote, act together or you do not have your act together. Maybe you yelled this morning on the way here to church and maybe even used some vocabulary that some of the presidential candidates use, okay? So maybe... <laughs> Maybe it was like that on the way to church this morning. I have news for you. It's okay. We are all, you know, no one's perfect here, and we don't claim to be perfect. And so sometimes we feel that way about church. I can't measure up to that. And so you have the, and, and same thing the Apostle Paul's done. He had the early church. They had the Jewish church. You have to understand that uh, just to kind of help reorient you if you had not been here before. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote this book to the Galatians, it was the early church, and primarily um, Christianity was Jewish. I don't know if you realize that. Jesus was actually Jewish. He was. He was a Jewish carpenter. And at 30 years old, he started a, started a ministry. And when he died and rose again from the dead, they started the churches. And it was primarily Jewish. Then all of a sudden, they started telling the non-Jewish people about it, and they were responding like you wouldn't believe. You know the old saying, you're not a prophet's not without honor except from his own people. And when the good news and gospel means good news was told to people outside the Jewish faith, they were licking it up. I mean, it was unbelievable. They were growing at such a fast pace and amazing things were happening. And, and, and God made it very clear to the apostles, don't have them to do all these rules and regulations, just have them serve me. 
And so the Apostle Paul is all excited about that, plants a church in Galatia, modern Turkey. Church is extraordinary, growing phenomenally. Then he, then he hears reports back that there's these people called Judaizers, and those are the high church folks. These are the, these are the church people. These, these are the folks that have it all together. They dress good. They look good. They smell good. They pray good. I mean, they act good. Their kids are good. Everything's good. And you're just, a, you're just a dirty Gentile, quote, unquote. And by the way, that's what the Jewish people called non-Jewish people, dirty Gentiles. And maybe you feel that way today coming to church. If anyone ever knew what I went through in the way here this morning to church, they wouldn't even let me be here. Well, I have news for you. All of us have fallen, the Bible says, and fallen short of God's glorious standards. There's not one that is right, no, not one. And so this is what was going on. And uh, what they also did in the early church, you had to do all these rules and regulations from the Old Testament, and that they made the men had to be circumcised or they were not in the church. And don't ask me to explain it, what circumcision is, and don't go to Google, please. But let's just say there was more women in the church than there was men. Uh, you can understand why. Uh, so this was what's going on. And so the Apostle Paul was, was beside himself, very frustrated, and yes, he was angry in the right way, and that's, what, that's why this letter was happening. And so we spoke about the first week, we spoke about there's two types of churches out there, not just Catholic and Protestant, not about that. There are life-giving churches that live in the knowledge of, uh, that don't live in the knowledge of the tree of good and evil, but they live in the tree of life. We spoke about that. Perhaps one of the most important concepts that we have at Cornerstone, I encourage you to go back and listen to that, because that's based upon everything we do here, is those two things. You can live in the knowledge of good and evil, it's all rules and regulations, or the tree of life, where it's about relationship, which promotes proper behavior, which helps you to live a right life. Instead of doing rules and regulations, you can't save yourself, and you can't do enough. And so we talked about that the very first week. And, and just to help folks that had not been here, uh, what that basically means is uh, you would go to church, and if you're living out of the knowledge of good and evil, I don't like the lights, I don't like the coffee's too strong, I don't like the fact that they're not serving donuts anymore. It's all like trying to find things wrong, and I can't believe they wear that at the church, I can't believe they, who do they think they are, uh, and all that kind of nonsense. And that's kind of like living in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or you're, if you're married, you look for all the things wrong with your spouse, and you let them, you let them know, you let her or him know, and it's all about finding stuff wrong. When you correct your children, it's like, what's wrong with you, stupid? And you talk to them in a, in a way that's all about rules and regulations, and you got to do this, this, and the other, and it's just a grocery list that no one can do. And, and the kids are like, huh? And, and maybe you're married or something like that. Maybe, I don't know what's going on. Maybe you're in school, and you just feel like you can't measure up, and you blew it. And, and, there's, and there's people like that. And then there's people that also say, hey, listen, I would, God saved me. He can save you. None of us are perfect, but God loves you. And there's a better way for us. And that's, a, that's you know, another, more important about becoming the right person than doing the right stuff. Let me say that again. It's more important that you become the right person than doing the right stuff. Because if you become the right person through Jesus Christ, you will do the right stuff. It takes care of itself. It's not about rules and regulations, though rules and regulations are important. And so today we're going to talk about, and this has been a tension within the church for a thousand millennia. And it still is a problem today. Remember you mentioned the fact there's the people out there, hey, man, it's all about grace, boy. You know, all you need is grace, da-da-da-da. All you need is grace, grace. It's that smoking grass type of Christianity. Hey, man, I'm just having a good time. It's the grace of Jesus. There's nothing I can do to take me out of his prayer. Then you have the other folks that, you know, if you watched, if you watched the movie this past week, you're going to hell, right? And it's all, yeah, yeah, you know, it's all about rules and regulations, and they're upset with everybody. So the apostle Paul was dealing with this. So today we're coming to chapter 3. And it's kind of ironic because the apostle Paul speaks in very strong language. Uh, in fact, he would say, he talks about grace, but why is he being so hard on them? Well, by the way, being a person of grace does not mean that you're, hi, how you doing? My name's Eric. I'm a pastor at Cornerstone Church. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. It doesn't mean like that. What it means is you have conviction, you have grace, you recognize who you are, you have boldness, not in yourself, but you have boldness in who you are. Does that make sense? It's like a, a police officer. I mean, I can go out right now in the middle of the street and go like this. People are going to be getting upset with me and do all kinds of things. But if I have a policeman's uniform on, and I truly am a policeman, and I go out in the middle of the street and go like this, they're going to listen to me. Not because I have authority and people will listen to me because I'm a, I'm a, I, have a, I have the pedigree. I'm an officer. All right? Same thing in the scriptures. Uh, when God covers you, he gives you authority. 
So we talk about all that. And so today, what I want to do is, is come to Galatians chapter 3 to deal with some of the things we just talked about, all right? And so if you could please turn to your Bibles and to Galatians chapter 3. And Paul is really ticked off. He is upset, really upset. And you're going to see here in a few moments, he starts right off here. Okay, listen to this one. Galatians 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. <laughs> well, that's pretty, you know, well, how's that? That, that sounds con condemning. No, he's saying, you guys are being foolish. What are you doing? That's foolish. Who has cast an evil spell on you? What, what's that supposed to mean? Well, in the Greek, it actually means evil eye. And I grew up Italian. Well, part of my heritage is Italian. And my grandfather was in this kind of state. He's going to give someone a hex. I'm going to give you the evil eye. And so they give you the evil eye. Oh. And so <laughs> maybe you group that way in church. You know, what you're talking about, Willis? Remember that? Okay. So that would be like, I'm dating myself. That would be the evil eye where you're looking down on somebody. I can't believe you're doing that. Well, he says, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made clear to you as if you've seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this question, he says. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit while you're now trying to become perfect by your human effort? Basically saying, listen, you were, there's no way you could save yourself. Imagine, if you will, today that some, all of us today walked in here today. Well, let's just say we had a $100 million mortgage on our home. $100 million, all of us. And let's just say for a moment that you work at Subway or McDonald's or, or you work at a minimum wage job. How many of you think you could pay that mortgage off? None of us could, right? And so what, what did Jesus do? Jesus died on the cross and he said, I pay the whole thing in full. I pay your mortgage. But all you got to do is hand in your deed, hand in your, hand, hand in your, your paperwork to me and, let, and sign it in faith and I'll take your mortgage off your hands. So whether you make $150,000 a year or even a million dollars a year, you, none of us could pay off that debt of $100 million. But Jesus basically signed off and bought all of our debt. So whether I have $10 million a year or I make $100 a year, none of us could pay it off. It's only what we're accepting what the, Jesus did for us by paying the mortgage. That's what he did on the cross. He said, it is finished. It is paid in full. And so what makes you right with God is not because you're good, you smell good, look good, you're married good, you're not married good, whatever. That's nothing to do with that. It has everything with putting your trust in what Jesus has done and taking upon yourself what he's offered. Does that make sense, everybody? That, that's, that's really simply what it's all about. And so he talks about this. He says, uh, was it by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be after starting your Christian lives in the Spirit while you're now trying to become perfect in your own human effort? You couldn't save yourself, nor do you have the power necessary to make all the right choices. That's good news, folks. Isn't that good news? Because some of us have a lot more willpower than other people. You put a pizza in front of me, I'm going to eat it. Okay? And some of us have different willpower. And it, it, you know, no matter where you are, it's not about your own strength. So you're saying you couldn't save yourself and you can't sustain yourself. And what happened is, with rules and regulations, I can keep all these rules and I feel good about myself. And that's what was happening. And they were looking down, all oh, those people. And he said, you guys have no idea how you forgot so fast. And the Apostle Paul's going off on that. And then Galatians 3.10, and by the way, I just wanted to hit a pause button here real quick. Uh, several weeks ago, I actually preached on Galatians 3 in great detail about, about uh, generational blessings and about Abraham. If you want to go to our website, you can look at that and get the rest of the chapter. I'm going to focus on one attribute of it today, okay? I don't want to re-preach what I preached three weeks ago. So that's why we're doing a little different tact here. But anyhow, back to what we're talking about. Um, he says here in Galatians 3.10, all who rely on obeying the law are under a curse. For it's written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. In other words, none of us can do it. And if you make one mistake, that's it. Galatians 2.10 says the following. I'm sorry. James 2.10 says the following. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who's broken all God's laws. 
So basically, uh, if you kill someone, you're a murderer. Whether you kill one person or kill 10,000, you're a murderer. You make one sin, all, the Bible says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. It's not one that's righteous, no, not one. So you make one mistake, God cannot handle sin. He just can't do it. He cannot accept it. There had to be payment for that, you see? So it's like that. You make one mistake. And I, I grew up and went to a Christian college, and, and when I was going to a Christian college, one of the, one, we always tried to find loopholes in the law, if you will, and say, well, you know, it's okay for me to go out and, and, and drink a keg and and funnel and all that kind of stuff because you know what you, you, you struggle with that and so you sin and I sin all sin sin makes no difference and so I can act this way with my girlfriend because after all who are you to tell me because you ever lost okay so you have sin I have sin so all the same makes no difference so I can go do what I want to do and this is with stuff that we used to try to that was a logic unfortunately that was predominant in, in, in often Christian circles we try to make excuses for these various things say hey it makes no difference but the truth of the matter is we've all fallen short and one thing they need to teach children and teenagers and us all is that when you make a mistake and you do a sin, there are consequences that you will have to face on this side of heaven. But you're not good enough to get to heaven anyhow. You're not good enough to make it happen. So whether you have $1 or a million dollars, it's not enough to pay that debt. Does that make sense? I just want to make sure you understand what I'm trying to say. So there are consequences to what we do, this side of heaven for sure. And, and even in the next, if we don't get right with Christ. So... The law could not be obeyed. In Galatians 3.19, what was the purpose of the law? What was the purpose? It could not be obeyed. They could not do it. Well, simply there's this. Galatians talks about it right here. 3.24 says this. Let me put it another way, the Apostle Paul says. The law was our guardian. It was like our nanny. Our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now the way of faith has come we no longer need the law as our guardian. So the law was a way to make yourself right with God, and you realize you couldn't follow it completely. And so they had something called blood sacrifices back in that day, a common practice in antiquity, and especially in those days, where they'd have a down payment until Christ came. And they realized they couldn't do this thing. They could not do it. And then Jesus came and paid the price. So he says, I paid the debt to that, okay? And so you cannot do enough. The law will show you what you cannot do. This is, I, I, this, is, this is a thing that has got the church in a lot of trouble through the years. So the law showed us what we could not do. It was our guardian. Verse 25, and now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. It's not the law that saves us. It's a relationship through Jesus Christ that saves us. Okay? It's not what you do. It's who you know. And so the law leads us to Jesus because it's like, I can't do this thing. And you couldn't save yourself nor can you do this thing by yourself. You can't. Maybe some of us have better uh, self-control than others, but the bottom line is you can't save yourself and you can't please God by yourself. God has purposely made us dependent upon him. So the law leads us to Christ. Galatians 3.24, the law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us, so we, it protected us until we could be made right with God through how? How do we get known with God? By faith. What's faith? Putting our complete trust, leaning completely, putting all of our weight on what Christ has done for us. So I like this. I, I heard this a, number, a while ago. I don't know where I got it from, but I wrote it down. and uh, It's called Living in Grace. This is a quote I got from someplace, but I like it. It says this. Truth without grace is mean. Truth without grace is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. Grace without truth is meaningless. Grace with truth is medicine. Isn't that good? i read it again. Truth without grace is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. But grace with truth is medicine. We need grace. And we need to follow God's way of doing things because he designed us and knows what's best for us. And he loves us and wants to see us to flourish. Okay, And so that's all part of it. And so what basically happened is when people put, I know this is like Christianity, like 101, but you know what? This is the stuff that trips people up. People forget how much God has forgiven us of our sins. People forget, no matter how good you think you are, you're not good enough. And they forget if not for God, Jesus dying on the cross, none of us could stand. And as a result, we start looking down, well, like, you know, they're baby Christians or they're, they're immature. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're spirit-filled. 
You know, we have the gifts of the Spirit, and we have this. We're the educated. We're, we're the Presbyterians. We know our theology. We're, we're the Baptists. We have holiness. Or we're the Pentecostal. We flow in the Spirit, and we're full of the gospel, and they're not. They deny the And you get to all this kind of nonsense. It isn't about that. It's about a relationship through Jesus Christ and trusting him for your salvation and trusting him to give you the strength you need to overcome. Isn't that good to know? I think it's good to know. That, you know, God, I can't fix this situation, but Lord, I need you in me. And we'll be talking more about that. So I want to go through an acrostic I got from Rick Warren. I like it a lot, you know, and uh, so I'm taking it. So it's great acrostic. Grace, G-R-A-C-E. And, it's only, and so first, grace, grace is a free gift. It's a free gift. You can't earn it. We talked about this all this morning. Bible says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the first thing. It is a gift. I think we've established that this morning. Number two, grace is received by what? By faith. That's what it said. I receive it in faith. I believe it in faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we've done, so no one can boast about it. What a great translation. That's what it's all about. None of us can boast. Jesus did it all for us. Remember, he paid that $100 million debt that, that no one else could pay. All right? And so... And so we talked about that. We spoke about Galatians 3. The power is ours. A month ago, we talked about that, about Abraham's uh, promise, that we have a promise through Abraham, which I encourage you to listen to. But, excuse me, Romans 4, 16 says this. The promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. Abraham was made right by not what he did, but what he received. You and I are made right not by what we do, but what we receive. And so that's good news for us. Faith puts you in touch with God's power. That's what faith does. It puts you in touch with God's father, um, power. Excuse me. And we need God to follow God. You need God to follow God. It's not like you get, okay, God, I, I'm a Christian now. I'm going to do it all myself. No, you can't do it by yourself, and you can't. And if you do it by yourself, you'll be exhausted, you'll, you'll get prideful, or you'll be humiliated. It could all happen the same day, by the way. Galatians 3, it happened to me. There's been times where I prayed and I felt God's power and I thought, oh, it was wonderful, Bible reading time and shared my faith and then I, and then I you know, I blow it later on. And <laughs> so, you know, we, it's, it's not about that. It's about receiving what God has done for us. So, Galatians 3, 5 says the following. I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? No, of course not. It's because you believe in the message you heard about Christ. Let me say something. You need the Holy Spirit, which is God's Spirit, to live this Christian life. If all I do every single week is say, okay, guys, stop it. Stop it. Every week, stop that. So you stop that. Next week, I'll come. Stop the other. And every week, what you stop me to stop doing. I'm going to, okay, where, where do you go? I go to the church, stop it. What's it? It's, it's called the first stop it in Cheshire. So every week we hear, stop it. And, oh, I feel good. I, I feel condemned. And, and what good is that? I mean, okay, stop it. Okay, how do you stop it? I don't know. You just got to stop doing it. So I don't do it. You do it. So stop it. And so every week I, I come here and I'll just tell you how you're screwing up the world and you need to change. And what good is that, right? And so maybe you grew up in a church like that. It's not about that. Instead, it's like, hey, I know somebody that will give you the power to overcome. And incidentally, you're not called to do this by yourself. You're called to do it in the community of believers, right? You're not called to, to conquer stuff by yourself. You're con conquered through Christ and through his body. So that's a beautiful thing about it. And the third thing is grace is available to everyone. Isn't that good news? It's available to anyone. I don't care if you're a Christian five minutes or 50 years. It's available to everybody. And Romans 10, 13 says the following. For whoever calls on the name, name of the Lord shall be saved. And the word say that so so means delivered, healed, whatever you need, it's there for you. Remember, it's not your own strength. It's the strength of God. You need God's spirit 
to overcome the things you're going through. And that happens not by doing rules, but by having a relationship with God who helps you to do the right thing because he designs you. He knows what's best for you. Okay? There's a difference between doing what's good for you and doing the rules. And, you know, Jesus was really hard on the people that focus on the rules. He was, he was ruthless on the Pharisees in, in particular that had all it figured out. And, and he said he was real, but he was really compassionate for the prostitute. He was real compassionate for the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. He says, who has not cast the first song? Who has not sinned cast the first stone? They all left from the oldest to the youngest. And he looks at the woman and says, woman, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. And so Jesus had grace among people. So grace only comes through Christ. John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses and grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He's the one that makes it rice for us, a rice, right. First I start with International House of Pancakes and now I'm talking about Chinese food. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm fighting a little deal here in my throat once again. I had a, a, a cold, and it's all that nonsense. Okay, Romans 5.15. Spring, come quickly. Okay, Romans 5.15. But there's a great difference. But there's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. What is that supposed to mean? Well, very simple. Adam was the first of mankind that made a mistake and caused sin to come upon the whole world. That doesn't seem fair to me. Why does one guy blow it with his wife and now we got to suffer the consequences? I don't like that very much. That's not fair. Well, bear with me for a moment. The good news is, since one man messed it up, one man made it right through Jesus Christ. I've shared this before, and it's kind of a hard concept to, to uh, understand, so I'm going to try to do it quickly. How many of you ever heard of polls? The Quinnipiac poll, the Zogby poll, the Gallup poll, whatever. They have all these polls. You hear about polls constantly, especially right now in this political season of primaries, right? Do you know what they do? They take a scientific sample. They take a group of 3,000 people, and they have a schematic that they do, and it's amazing how accurate it is. It, it really is amazing. Uh, real clear politics has, takes them all. And they take all these samples and they, and they, say, and they say, well, 35% believe this. And sure enough, when people vote, 35% do. It's amazing. Why? They took a poll of society and found out the temperature of what's going on in society. You, you follow me so far? Okay. When Adam sinned, he, instead of being the zombie poll, it was the Adam poll. What I mean by that is he basically showed the state of humanity based upon how he acted. And Jesus took another poll saying, hey, 100% can be right with, through, through God by me. I hope you guys are getting that. Because people don't like all this and they criticize, but meanwhile, the, the society lives by polls. And Jesus was the one that set us free from Adam's mistake. Because Adam represents us all. He was a real person, but he represents us all. And so Jesus made it right. First Adam screwed up, but second Adam made it right. And that's what happens. Grace only comes through Jesus Christ. And so in John 14, 6, for example, it says this. Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, he's saying all roads do not lead to heaven. Every road has to come through me first or there's no going to God. Now, this will get you in trouble in the world today. People will get upset with you. They're okay with you believing in God, but the moment you say, only Jesus, that is so narrow-minded. You think you have the truth. Who do you think you are saying that Jesus is the only way? Islam's the way. Buddhism is the way. Confucianism is the way. Uh, confusion's the way. Whatever. Agnostic is the way. Uh, who are you to tell me that Jesus is the only way? That's real small-minded. You may think it's small-minded, but you know, if I go on top of this building and I say, don't jump off, oh, you're being small-minded. If you jump off, you're going to break your leg. No, I'm not. Yes, you will. No, I'm not. Go ahead, jump off the building, see what happens. But please don't do that, okay? But, you know, it's not hateful saying that. We believe the truth. Well, how arrogant. You're saying that God's sending everyone to hell? What kind of God would send the whole world to hell? No, the world is not, God's not sending anyone to hell. People are choosing to go to hell because God's perfect and you're not. And the default setting is hell. 
is separation from God, okay? And it's a place you don't want to be. You want to know what hell's like? Just take all the beauty of life, take all love, all grace, and suck it out of the room, and that's what you're left with. It's a real place. So how is that fair? Why would God send anyone to hell? He doesn't send. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. That's why he sent Jesus, okay, to pay the price for what you and I can't do. Every other religion is about you, you got to do. Christianity is done, <laughs> okay? Islam, for example. you got to do all these rules and regulations. If you don't do these things and you don't do the five things and the different pillars, you're not going to go. And all roads do not lead to heaven. I'm sorry to say this, folks. I, I wish it was true, but it's not. Islam is a false religion. There are wonderful people that follow the Muslim faith, Islam, but they're, they're wrong. In fact, do you realize this? This is a little side note, but it's important to realize this. When people say, well, it's all to make a difference what you believe. It does make a difference what you believe. Muhammad had an angelic visitation. We believe it was from a demon that gave him the laws of, of helped him write the Quran. The Quran was written after that, by the way. And the Quran's all about what you have to do. Buddhism's about a philosophy of a de detachment. You got to do this, and then you get to the place of nirvana. It's all about things you've done, do. Christianity is about, it's done through a relationship with God. A vast difference. But what about all the Muslims? And what happens to the folks in Saudi Arabia? God going to send them all to hell? You know, amazingly enough, God is doing, we have a person in our church who is, uh, um, Darius Gomahadi had a visitation, had a vision of Jesus and gave his life to Christ. We have to show that testimony again. Amazing. Some great things are happening. But this was to happen. This what, what about people who never hear the gospel? Well, this is what happens to them. How many of you ever, we all have a sense of what's right and wrong, don't we? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Whether you know God or not, I shouldn't be doing that. And your conscience tells you not to do something because God's wired you a certain way. If you deny what God's told you to do, guess what begins to happen? You grow a callus on your conscience. So no longer does it feel like it's wrong or right anymore. And that's dangerous. So Christianity... For Jesus Christ comes along and says, hey, this is the way, this is the truth and the life, and you, you embrace the truth, and you don't go the wrong direction. So everybody, Buddhists, whoever, they're going to have to go through Jesus. And how are they with Jesus? That's, that's what happens. So I, you and I can't go around, hell, heaven, hell, heaven. We don't have the ability to do that. But we do say that Christ is the only way. Does that make sense, everybody? Because there's a lot of people that would try to paint us in the corner and say, you tell it, you should. No, it's not about that. It's through Jesus Christ. There's no other name which a man or woman can be saved except through Jesus Christ. And so we want to help people come to know Christ. Okay? God judges you on the information you have. But you know what? A lot of us have bad information. So it's important to understand that. So I need to say that because I struggled growing up hearing this all the time. I was like, what's the deal with that? You, who do you think you are? Well, it's through Jesus Christ. And the Bible says... In Acts 4.12. Nor is there salvation in any other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men which we can be saved. <laughs> okay, it's pretty clear. And then Galatians 2.21 says this. Don't treat the gracious God as meaningless. For if we could be saved by keeping the law, then there would be no need for Christ to die. Okay? The reason why Christ is here is to save us and to give us the power to live where we're supposed to live. Now, grace is not a license to sin. It's the answer to overcoming sin. Grace is not an excuse to sin. It's the answer to overcome sin. God, I need your grace. I need your help in this. Romans 6, 1 says this. Well, then. Should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how shall we continue to live in it? And, fi and finally, grace is extended through eternity. It's good news. So grace comes, by, comes through Christ. That's how it comes. And John, you know, we, we know about John 3.16. We hear it all the time. So how does this work? How does this whole thing, grace, work? And, you know, what I find so amazing is I've seen a lot of people in the church in general be really critical of people outside the church. So let me give you an example. I, I, I know people that just, you know, like, please, when I give examples, I'm very careful not to divulge private information I've shared with a lot of people in this church. But I do have interaction with people outside the church. So I respect everyone. But I, I've talked to some people that really struggle in various ways. I talked to a gentleman not too long ago. Uh, 
and uh, he really struggles with his marriage, big time. He's a Christian and all that. And he starts talking. He's, he's, he starts criticizing. You're like, oh, I can't believe the homosexuals are this. And he's criticizing all of them. I said, wait a minute. I said, I said, don't you have a problem with your marriage? Yeah, yeah. Well, you talk to me. You tell me you struggle with lust, right? Yeah. And you participate in lust and, and act in lust. So who do you think you are to look at the homosexuals and say they're wrong? Well, that's different. No. It's not really different at all. You know why? Because you, you struggle with lust, and he act, you know, I'm not going to get into the details, okay, what happens, but he struggles, and well, my wife and I never get together, so I haven't, and that's not right, by the way. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, do not deny each other sexually, except for a time of fasting and prayer. Husbands and wives are supposed to render each other, give each other respect, and help us to live a right life. And so his marriage is unhealthy. And so he's struggling in his marriage, and as a result of that, he's giving into lust, looking at pornography, and making excuses for it. Well, God understands. I said, then how, well, how dare you? Why are you so hard on, on these so homosexual people that struggle and some people are, are giving into it? Why are you so hard on men? You're, well, it's different. No, it's not different. You have a different passenger in the car of your struggle. All right? So what you're doing is just as bad as them because you know better and you're doing it. Actually, you're, better, you're worse off. And so I was getting kind of hard with the guy. And, 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 and please understand, I'm not suggesting for a moment there's right and wrong. And there's proper behavior and improper behavior. But we got to be careful, folks, that we don't go out there pointing fingers at people because we don't struggle with something. I, I, I'm not suggesting for a moment that a homosexual lifestyle is appropriate. It's not what God intended. But people out there are struggling with it, and the church needs to be a place where they can safely land and have grace. Not grace to live that lifestyle, but grace to get through it. You know why? I've talked to people about this. I've talked to um, a couple of different homosexuals some of that were practicing, some of that were not practicing. And one guy that was practicing, he said, you know, and we started talking, and I, I think it was at an airport a couple years ago, it was in, in between, we started talking, and he says, and, and people speak a lot at airports, by the way, because they think they'll never see you again, so they open up and they tell you everything, <laughs> all right? So we started talking, and I didn't want to tell them I'm a pastor because that's frustrating, because when they tell you a pastor, they close down. So what do you do? I, I'm a speaker, <laughs> motivational, I'm a life coach, and... You know, finally, I, what do you, well, I teach. What do you teach? Oh, I'm a pastor of a church. All right. And so I so said, what's, what's with you guys against home? You know, you, you. I said, listen, I said, I'm no better than you. I struggle with stuff. I don't struggle with that. But I have passions. I have passions to, don't misunderstand me, I have passions to, to be unfaithful to my wife. Temptations. I never want to do it. But I have temptations to do the wrong. I have temptations to steal. I've been, and what protects my relationship with my wife is that we have a good relationship. We talk to each other. We love each other. We have a good relationship, and that's a protection to me. But I, I share with the guy, I struggle with stuff. He said, really? And you're a Christian? I said, yeah. I said, I don't struggle with what you struggle with, but I struggle. I said, yeah, sure. I would, I, I would, I'm tempted to commit adultery. I'm not going to lie to you. Sure, I've been tempted in the past, but I don't give in to it. I, I've been tempted to lie, and I do lie at times, especially when I preach. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I shared with this gentleman about that. And I said, and I basically said, listen, you know, we're not, I, I apologize on behalf, I, this is not, rep, I don't represent the church. God loves you and has a better way for you. Your struggle is different than my struggle, but we all struggle. Okay? And so there's a better way for you. What's well, not fair? And, and, and incidentally, the, why I'm bringing this up for? Because I had a heated discussion with this individual, not at the airport, the other person that's a Christian that teaches Bible studies in a church, not this church. And as a, spirit, and as a leader, on, on, is on the church committee for leadership. He says, well, I can't help it. This is the way I am. I said, who do you think you are condemning other people who say, that's just the way I am? You just said the same thing. And so I said, well, who are you, you're judging me. I said, no, I, I, I'm no better than you either, my friend. But I recognize the fact that I'm doing something wrong. And what you're doing is wrong. Well, what do I do? I said, make your marriage work. How am I supposed to do that? You get what you allow. You get in your marriage what you tolerate. If I were you, I would get my wife and say, honey, this is not a marriage. We either go to a counseling or I'm leaving. How can you say that? Well, you know what? That's part of desertion. Pastor, you're getting into stuff that you shouldn't talk about. No, it's called real life. This is real life, folks. You know, if you want to just talk about theology and listen, the Bible is practical. It talks about everyday life. And so we, as a church, need to be a people that do not water down the truth of God. 
We need to reach out to people that struggle with all sorts of things. Just because you don't struggle with something doesn't mean you're better than somebody else. All right? Some of you don't struggle with pizza like I do. Okay? Thank you. One laugh. I, I mean, I've been talking about food all morning at an international house. Pancakes, pizza, rice, okay? So I obviously have an issue. But seriously, I say all of this, if the worship team make their way up, I say all of this because I really want to help people. Don't, listen, I'm sharing stuff with you that frustrated me to no end with the church. This stuff drove me batty. And I almost gave up on church altogether because of the attitude. It's not about that. Jesus died so we could have freedom. And he loves us. And he knows what's best for us. You don't have to have a lousy marriage. You don't have to be stuck in a lifestyle that you really don't want to do. And you know, deep down you're saying, that's wrong. I shouldn't be doing that. There's a better way for you. And so God would have that for you. And so, you know, grace is extended through eternity. How, how's it grace? Grace comes through Jesus Christ. And so, my friends, we need to detach from works, and we need to attach to grace so we can do works. I don't know about you, but if I have to follow all these rules, I'll quit today. I'm done. If I have to do all these rules without Jesus, I quit today. I can't do it. But thank God, through the power of Jesus Christ, his presence... I have things in my life that I want to overcome, certain habits. Man, what do I keep doing? I got to change that. I can't change. I'm powerless. I go, okay, God, I need you. And so what I do is I, I say, Holy Spirit, you need to help me out with this. And then guess what else I have to do? Guess who Jesus is? Jesus is what? He has a body, doesn't he? And that's you and me. So we need each other to help each other out too. They never sent the disciples out one by one. They sent them out two by two at least. It takes community to grow in the Christian faith. So if you're struggling, be careful who you share with. Listen, I want this to be a place that Jesus has intended to be, a place where you and I can get connected to Jesus Christ, be saved from our sins, and then have the power to live the life that God has destined us to live. Don't give in that this is the way I am. No, you don't have to be that way. We can work together as a family. Okay, but if you think I'm going to judge you, you're not going to tell me anything, are you? Of course not. But if you realize that the person realizes that if not by God, they would not be here either. That we're all on the, we're on a predicament. None of us are good enough. We all have a hundred million dollar debt, and none of us have enough money to pay it off. But Christ did. Do you see the difference, folks? I hope this is a nuance, a grace and works. It's so, it's such a thing that gets so screwed up. I hope I've showed you today grace and truth. Grace is when what you ought to do becomes what you want to do. And let me tell you right now, I, I'm telling you, if I don't read my Bible, I used to feel guilty. Oh, I didn't read my Bible, I didn't pray. I'm a lousy Christian. Oh, what's wrong with me? Now it's like, oh, I didn't read my Bible today. I miss not having my time with God. You, you see the difference? And so God has good plans for all of us in this room and those that are watching live or later on. God has, he, he, he wants you to live in his grace. So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you so much, Lord. I know I've stepped on a lot of stuff, but Lord, you know, we're tired of playing church. Lord, I'm tired of religion that just talks about some nebula that we can't even touch. Father, I thank you that the Bible is so plain and so true and shows the good, the bad, the ugly, and the beautiful. Father, I thank you for the men and the women that you show us through the pages of Genesis to Revelation that lived just like we did. They failed, they had successes, they had failures. And despite all that, Lord, you love us enough to save us. Father, thank you that we don't have to do it all. Thank you that we can't make ourselves right. Lord, we lean upon you today. With every head bowed, I'm going to ask you a question today. If you were to die today, just heard from a friend of ours in the church, a guy was riding his ATV, a 13-year-old kid, flipped it, landed on him, he died. 13 years old, out with his family, having a fun time doing, you know, ATVs in the back roads. This happens three days ago. You don't know when your last time is. And so what are you going to say to God? Go to heaven. Oh, God, let me in. Why? I'm pretty good. God does not judge us on the curve. He judges us on the cross. The only way you're not going to be right with God is through Jesus Christ. I have good news for you. No matter what you've done and what you've been through, if you give your life to Jesus Christ today, you can be free of all your sin. 
and begin a new journey with grace. So if you want to give your life to Christ, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you pray this prayer from your heart, mean it. That's all you have to do. Confess with your mouth that you believe in Jesus, believe in your heart, and you'll be saved. So we're going to pray this prayer with me quietly. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross. And I believe you rose again from the dead. I give you all of my sins right now. I thank you. I cannot save myself. But I trust in what you've done. I give you all my junk. And everything that's wrong and everything that's good, I give it to you right now. I ask you to forgive me of all the things I've done wrong, both known and unknown. And I choose this day, Lord, I choose this day to follow you with your help. In Jesus' name. As we just had a pause there for a second, I just believe there's a couple of you in here right now or maybe watching, you're saying this, well, I'm not ready to pray that prayer yet because I, I need to get myself together first. Uh, how ridiculous would it be if, you, if I ask you to take a shower, you say, well, I can't take a shower until I take a shower. <laughs> What? I, 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 I'm not going to take a shower until I take a shower. I can't take a shower until I shower first. You see how ridiculous that would be? So I'm going to get my act together first, and then I'll go to God. You can't. God takes you just as you are. And so if you want to receive him today, you just pray that prayer and say, Jesus, I gave my life. Every head bowed. Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Just see a quick show of hands. Say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Thank you. Thank you. All across the room. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you for being honest this morning. Listen, we're a family here, about five or six or seven of you that have prayed. If you're praying online, please go and, and, and do that. I'm going to pray a prayer for the rest of us because we're all in this together, all right? Lord Jesus, we want to be a church that's full of your grace. We thank you, Father God, that you have good plans for us, a hope, and a future. Father, we thank you no matter what we've been told by our doctors, by our counselors, by our parents, by our bosses, by our friends. We thank you that their word is not as secondary to your word. And Lord, we choose this day to live in your grace. You say this by your grace, and you sustain us by your grace. We reject legalism. We reject judgmentalism. And we choose to embrace your truth, realizing that if not, through, not for you, none of us could stand. Lord, I pray that you'd heal marriages today, Lord God. I pray you'd heal the relationship between parents and children today. And we thank you that you are God of new beginnings in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, uh, before we sing the last song, there's a little card in your... We try to keep track. We try to keep track of everybody. We're going to start having baptisms in, uh, at the first of every month. We're going to have a baptism. Every month we're going to have baptisms. We're going to start doing that. There's a lot of people getting their lives to Jesus. And we want to help you along the way. We're going to change things a little bit to help you along the way. But right here in this card, Cornerstone Church Connection card, it says, I have recommitted my life or have given my life to Christ. Could you please fill that out and, and give it to one of the ushers or bring it up front to one of the prayer team. Prayer team, please make your way up. And we will contact you and help you on your new journey. Listen, we're, on all, we're in all this thing. We're in this together, folks. We're on a journey. Let's do it together. Amen? God bless you, everybody. Let's have the last song. Thank you. God bless you all. Listen, as you leave her today, take a bunch of these and invite folks to come Friday, Saturday, Friday and Sunday. Uh, if you'd like to find out about spiritual gifts and all that, we have some extra spaces right out that uh, conference room. Otherwise, we dismiss you. If you need prayer, our prayer team's up. God bless you guys. Thank you. <laughs>